right, so here we go. Then we've got the maps, a few notes, and I'll give you time to read, uh, kind of finish up chapter 17. I gave you the review list yesterday for the test. And what day do you want to test? Uh, today. Today? Uh, no, yesterday. 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 yesterday, I'm very disappointed with how you did. I got nothing, I got nothing from you to grade. Take out the maps. It's, if you're any last minute questions, if not, I will collect the, the map. Okay, so I'm looking at Tuesday for the test. And I just don't like Monday test because of the shortened periods. So map, map, make sure your name is on it, your rank and serial number. Can you stats on you? This is you're making up your rank, sure. Yeah. And tomorrow. Okay. And very good, very good. Uh, what's the Is there one on the review list? We're good on that. Did this change your life? Did you tell everybody you saw this? Uh, what currency is that? Yeah, it's it's kind of a weird combination of ruble and pounds. So just go with it. By the way, we've got to watch to the very end of this because this is my. Favorite. Right here. Not much change. Whatever Trevor Scott does, I'm buying it. All right. So a couple of these about Peter. I'm taking the mask off. It's, we're down to 11 cases. And so I hopefully, and then of course, a new variant is forming. We might have the mask back on. That's always going to happen. Yeah. Because the thing is, I gave myself a target, and I'm, there was a logic to it. Well, with that, Peter, his dad, Alexis, died. And his dad was bizarre for a very short time. We're not going to go through all the czars. The Romanov, they're part of the Romanov family. The Romanov dynasty would end, but they would still call themselves Romanovs after he died. So technically, when I told you it ended in 1918, it actually died in the 1700s, but that's another story. And, but we're going to talk a little bit about him. So when his dad, he, he died, he was named Kozar with his brother Ivan. And that's him at 10 years old. But Ivan... Ivan was uh, uh, basically they said had the mentality of about a five year old and was never really able to truly be Kozar and he'd eventually be kind of pushed aside. But his half sister, sister Sophia, and here's a very dour looking Sophia right here. That does not look like a woman. It's Sophia. That's Sophia. That's Sophia. That's Sophia. Sophia was regent. And regent, um, you're basically administered for the young Peter and Ivan, but it's basically Peter. And she wrapped herself around the old believers, very orthodox Christians who want to reestablish the old role of the boyers. And she had the boyers behind them. And the big issue became who will control the military? As Peter grew in the adulthood, will it be Sophia or will it be Peter? And if it's therefore a battle is set up with the Boyers and Sophia, it's going to be a real power struggle. She wants to be Zarin. By the way, that's a heck of a picture, isn't it? Yeah, she does look fierce. Don't mess with Sophia. And that's going to lead to what's called the Revolt of the Strelsky. The Strelsky were her is the guard, the Kremlin, the Kremlin guards, the capitals in Moscow. The Kremlin is also the, the center of the church and the government. Today it's the center, I guess, of both two, the church of Putin and Putin. But but everyone knew it was behind, Sophia was behind it. And so it was basically Sophia versus Peter. But Peter was able to go to the army outside of the guards. 
and a lot of popular resentment against the boyers or the nobility. And at age 22, Peter came out victorious. So Via was sent to a convent. That's kind of what they did. <laughs> You're off to a convent. And here's a picture of the revolt of the Strelsky, and that's supposed to be the Kremlin. I don't know what's going on either, but these are pipes, and they're like, if this is the scale, it's somewhere between 20 and 30 miles long. I don't think the way they call that. Hmm? Russians are tough. Or they were. Now nah, they're just fine. So now, they're like the only people that thought of Peter's period of time. So once he became czar, he went on what's called the Great Embassy. What the embassy means, so the embassy is, is where um, the representatives from your country go live. They go live in countries where the ambassador and whatever members of your foreign ministry, et cetera, go live in their capital. Well, he would be a representative to Western Europe because he wanted to see how to modernize Europe. Not that, now I covered him after the Enlightenment, but he's not enlightened. He just wants to make Russia strong and him strong. And so he is taking the representative of the government with him, thus it's called the Great Embassy, as he goes across Europe into London and tours the West. And he tried to act like everybody, I tried to make a deal that, that he was just a member of this crew of traveling Russians and would be treated no differently. Yet everyone called him Sire, and he was 6'9". And so he looked radically different than everybody else. He's like a giant to everyone else. And the thing about it is, you think 6'9 six, six, stands out now. Yeah. Think how 6'9 would stand out then. In Russia, it was average. Yeah, Russians are big. Of course, he went to the Netherlands, and that's the tallest country in the world now. The average height of someone from the Netherlands is 7 foot 2. I made that up. It, it's God, seven I wish I was born there. <laughs> But the Netherlands, yeah, they're, they're very tall in the Netherlands. Um, that was the only place I've ever been in my life where there were a significant number of women taller than me. And I'm 6'3". That's kind of unusual. Uh, Jordan Montana. Okay. So with that, here he is supposedly making ships in, in the Netherlands. And, he, and this, I, the whole big deal. Remember they mentioned in the video, do you remember the video? Yeah, yeah. Where he spent his fleet by 1945. Yeah. He loves ships. He actually went and, and worked on ships, and here he is supposedly constructing ships. He kind of play around and then go drink a lot. Basically what Peter the Great did. Went to London, but he's watching and observing. What can he take from there and bring to Russia to make Russia stronger and him stronger? And one of the big things, the military. So what we need is a professional military, but you need soldiers now, pikemen, musketeers, not just going to kind of round up men when the war began. So peasants will be recruits. What that means is they're going to be forced into the army for life. Basically, they'll get a deal they can't refuse. And this is a lifetime commitment. In fact, the story was they go to the army, you say you, um, the, the goodbye is a funeral. Pretty hard. I, I can't even imagine how harsh it was. But it's not quite what we call conscription yet, but or the draft, but that's coming. The nobility would want to serve as officers, and that began the idea of what we need educated officers. And that's what the video was funny, but it's true. They had to figure out how to aim artillery. Nothing the video said was wrong, actually, including the part about a upright country of service. What about the British team? Being alive that might be the only problem. In well, 1945. How do you know? It? They didn't have foreign ships. Oh, okay. 1945. <laughs> but uh, the, they had, they adopted like uh, the remember the British model army, and they all had red uniforms, and therefore you could see in these smoky battles, and soon everybody would adopt one color. Well, the Russians would adopt green. Why green? They could stand out, and you they could order the men and move the men and see them kind of, in a smoky battlefield. And then they adopted a brand new invention, a, a major, major innovation. The musket with a socket bayonet. So a flintlock musket. And so these are men with a flintlock musket. But instead of pikes, pikemen were going away all over Europe and he followed. Here is a socket bayonet. So I thought I'd show you this. So you have your long musket, muzzle-loaded. The first um, 
bayonets were actually, here's the muzzle, and they would just stick a pike into it. Or like stick like a sharp, uh, they say a knife into it? Yeah, well not even knife, just think about a, a, like a spear. I feel like that takes up the use of the gun away. <laughs> yeah, because you can't, obviously you can't fire your gun or load the gun. This is such a big innovation, but it requires industry. Okay, skilled craftsmen to make it still pre-industrial revolution. So in the video they said factories, well, think about skilled craftsmen doing it. And it's a socket, so it fits over the barrel so you can still load it. And then you have the bayonet that way. Here's the bayonet sticking up. And if you brace your musket on your hip, you now have a pike. Who has a bayonet? It's two, it's two in one. A pike and a gun. Almost. It's still really hard to load once you have the bayonet off. It's one of the big deals in war from, you have all the way from the 17th century, all the way through the American Civil War, all the way to, to about 1870. Once you fix bayonets, you're basically stuck. You gotta charge. Because it's really hard to load a musket, even with this on. But it's still a major innovation. Or could you take it off effectively? Yeah, because that, uh, See, that, that's not a sight. That's what you lock the musket on, and you just turn it and pull it off. And one more thing about it, you notice what shape the, you can see it here. You notice it's triangular. Why is it like that? It's not a knife, it's not a point, it's triangular. So it's harder to get it back together? Yeah. When you stick somebody with that, it doesn't heal naturally. It forms a weird shape. Puncher works pretty good too. But that even is worse. So you, these are, this is horrible, but bleed out. But a puncher works, you're like a slash, it heals up more naturally, and it's easier to stitch. So, also begin to westernize various things. So, the beer tax is one. But first thing, bring technology. Start trying to get, in fact, he, they paid for skilled craftsmen from the Netherlands or Britain to come to Russia and teach them. Skilled craftsmen, because the Russians are clearly as smart as anybody else, they just didn't have those skills. Also, the policy of mercantilism. Remember, accumulating as much gold as possible. That's why we need more empire. He started advancing towards the Black Sea and wanted access to the Baltic Sea. State-owned industry, not factories, just think of the terms more like big buildings with lots of craftsmen working together. Lots of crowds. This is still pre-industrial revolution. The industrial revolution is actually going to be right at the end of this unit. That's going to begin. When we do the French Revolution next week, the industrial revolution is beginning in Britain. And that's supposed to be monopolies. <laughs> that's another example of me trying to drive real fast. Miles. I got to change that one because that's, that's annoying. Auto piles? That's pretty funny. Give me a second. <laughs> All right. Monopolies. So if they weren't owned by the state, they had a monopoly. And taxing everything. Still at a time where there's no set currency, there's no way to control finances, so you need gold or silver. And that's where you get the beer tax, the head tax, which is also the sole tax, a death tax, they tax everything. So here is, you don't pay your tax, you lose your beard. You wanna keep your beard, you gotta carry this token around to show that you had a token that you paid your tax to keep your beard. If not, it's off. How would they shave it exactly? Huh? How would they shave the beard? Unpla yeah. They'd cut it off very crudely, so it'd cut you up pretty good, too. And a secret police to watch everybody, just like Ivan the Terrible. To make sure everyone is, is following his decree, westernizing. And the ones he spied out, what, what the peasants? It was the, the nobility. Every place the nobility went. That's the big one they spied on. Oh, trust me, they'll spy on others. And so... Oh, also, no more long coats. They got rid of the long coats for the military, so they wearing kind of a Prussian-style jacket with the uniforms right here or right here. And nobility had to wear um, a jacket. Actually, those, those were cut right above, right, right under the belly button, right here. And the thing about it was, 
You wear that, and they showed them with the uh, the tights. I don't know if you know this. It's cold in Russia. Long coats oh, keep no. the cold. Yeah, they keep the cold out. Also keeps the heat out too. So what do you wear? And if you're going to the jungle, wear a long coat. You'd be cooler because it keeps the heat out. That's science. Trust me. Next you time you go, that's how it just trust me. Yeah. Well, oh, I always forgot table manners. So he brought this brand new thing called the knife and fork, and he made them all eat with a knife and fork, which they were appalled. Russian men don't do that. And so you had to eat with a knife and fork. And they would watch and they would spy on you, and you could be punished for not eating with a knife and fork. And I agree, it's much easier with your hands, but I've got I've got head and forks right here. <laughs> and so with that, a couple of things they did. It's called the table of ranks. And here is the table of ranks where they will list out educational standards for all government workers. So the video implied that it was all education for everybody, not just for nobility and civil service, but to a country that was relatively illiterate, especially compared to the rest of Europe. You know, heck, once you get to Poland westward, it was getting more and more literate. Doesn't make you smarter. Make you able to read. Yes. And but if everybody had to do this to get some high-ranking government position or to become an officer in the army, it's a way to control borders. It's kind of like having to go to Versailles. They have to go hat in hand to Peter to try to get this or get this for their children. And he's going to fight a massive war with Sweden. Sweden is still a powerful country. Remember the Swedish phase of the Thirty Years' War? They had a powerful army. Sweden controlled this Baltic coast right here. Also intriguing to Poland and Lithuania. The warrior king for Sweden was Charles XII. A brilliant officer, a fighter, uh, known for his just almost insane courage, organizing and rallying soldiers. He was already developing the new battle tactics that Peter wanted to develop. So his smaller army defeated Russian and Polish armies time after time. The Swedes are going to be known for a great military. Now, partially this war will convince them to become neutral down the road. Because there's all these Swedish victories at first. But Charles wanted to get Moscow. He thought that if he could knock Moscow out, he could control this entire coastline. Who knows? This might allow them to take big hunks of what was then Poland, Lithuania. And who knows what's going to happen? And so he invaded towards, here's Moscow, into the central Russian plain, hoping out flanking, abandoning its supply line, living off the land and marched mile after mile being harassed by what were those fierce cavalry of the steppes? Okay. Cossacks. And that allowed Peter, after a series of de disastrous defeats up here, to rebuild his army and organize it now in the Swedish lines as the Swedish army leads away. And think about it. Difficult to find food, men dying of disease. The great Swedish army is not what it was. And so, Instead of advancing towards Moscow, Charles is kind of pushed this way. And eventually we're going to have the Battle of Poltava. And one of the most decisive battles in history, where Peter the Great is at, at a fortress around the, the now Ukrainian city, Poltava, and Charles felt he had no choice but to attack it because finally he's, he's got to be able to defeat Peter's army. Charles had his men dig trenches. Here's trying to show the battle. Here's the Russian defenses. Right, here's right here. Here's Peter. And he stuck his head over the parapet and was hit in the head. And Charles XII died there. And when that happened, the Swedish army broke, and it was a horrible. He wasn't killed, but he was horribly wounded. A horrible defeat. A horrible defeat for the Swedes. And that would change everything. Everything. A now very heavily wounded Charles and the rest of the army would actually, it's just, so, just a weird little turn of events. They would go into the Ottoman Empire and he'd hang out there for a couple of years. He'd go back and try to date and take Denmark and Norway and that's what he would want. But, because he all he knew was a fight. But now Russia controlled the South Baltic. 
And now Peter, the Treaty of Nystad, got all of this. Now Peter is thinking, if we're going to modernize, if we want mercantilism, we need partners. Because the Ottoman Empire is way too strong to really get this way. By the way, you notice it's just off of Kiev. You see all these maps with the Russian spelling of Kiev, and I will occasionally call it Kiev. That's what I grew up with. I grew up with Kiev. We're friends. But, not the ball. And if we're going to modernize, we got to get out of the ancient old capital of Moscow. This old, decrepit place. And he would make, why did I do that? I was playing, I think I did that last year, playing with it. St. Petersburg. And you'll notice St. Petersburg, that's not a Russian name. That's a Ger that's German. Petersburg is German, implying we're moving west. <coughs> Sirius looking at the North Sea. They went to a swamp. Yes, it was a swamp. Yes, thousands of peasants would be worked to death, filling in the swamp and making St. Petersburg. But he would make his glorious capital on the sea. So in World War I, they would change it to Petrograd because they didn't want a German name for the capital. Then after the Bolshevik Revolution, they changed the name to Leningrad. When I was your age, it was Leningrad. Now it's St. Petersburg again. And he built this amazing summer palace right here. This is still one of the top tourist destinations in Russia today, going to this. I guess it's amazing. I know people have gone there. I would really like to go. There are reasons why I'm not going to go to Russia. Some of you might know them now. Uh, Actually, it wouldn't be a good idea for an American to go to Russia right now. But here he is supposedly looking at the plants. Built this amazing city. I guess it is really beautiful. And you can see Russia as this massive area. Even though I had this huge area, very few people lived in it. Here's that expanse under Peter the Great and expanse all the way to the Pacific and Siberia. Partially because the people there didn't know what hit them. There weren't very many people there. But in 1725, Peter did die. Probably about bladder infection. Probably about 1945. Yeah, died in 1945. It was a bladder infection. What do you, you know, what do you do? And so they actually probably had gangrene in this bladder, which I can't even imagine getting involved with that. Antibiotics are a good thing. Moving on. Of course, it's kind of scary. Now we have superbugs. That's another story for down the road, too, maybe. So he'd be replaced by his daughter, Catherine I. And after her reign, it would go into a series of turmoil. Her son would take power, but only would be, be Tsar, her young son, but he only lasted a couple years. Then he died very young, and then it would, the dynasty ended. They had to find a cousin. They brought the cousin in. When she died, it went to her son. Her son's cousin decided, I didn't like that, and had him overthrown, and he mysteriously died. And so now we're at distant cousins of Peter, and we're getting to Catherine the Great. So let's do very quickly the enlightened monarchs. We'll come back. We're not going to go all the Romanovs. And so let's do the enlightened monarchs. Tomorrow we'll do a war and then the test. So on Monday I'll do any review and then we will start the French Revolution on Monday, even though that won't be on the test. Everyone okay with that? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Catherine. Oh, I almost forgot. We do have to mention Rokoko. Rokoku art, or late, we already talked about Baroque art, you know, the really glorify the Christian or the Catholic Church. That's going to come, Baroque art is going to come in. I'm not a huge fan of Baroque art. I know a lot of people really like it. And um, Rococo, it's too really for me. I like Renaissance and I like, I love Impressionist and Romantic art. You like Rococo? Because you just like saying the word Rococo. No, I uh, it, is, it, it is, it is, it's kind of spectacular. Um, I won't deny that. Okay, I don't hate it. It's just not my favorite. That's good. Really Picasso. Okay. I like Picasso. 
But that we're getting into impressionism abstract. And so, but it wasn't just um, the church. This would now also be used to glorify absolute monarchs, to glorify the aristocracy. Here's the big thing, to glorify divine right. To glorify the divine right monarchs. So we'll have all these pictures of, oh, that's Miss Maria Matt. We'll get to her. And the lifestyle, how wonderful and beautiful they are. But you see all these Rococo artists of Rococo art of every single nobility. If you go to any of these country homes or any of these estates, there's Rococo everywhere. Maybe that's why I'm not a big fan of nobility. And so it's there's the uh, uh, Winter Palace in St. Petersburg, Rococo. Here's inside um, in Potsdam. Um, Charlottesburg, the, where the um, King of Prussia was, Rococo. Very fancy, ornate, gold gilded, that's Rococo. And so let's get to the enlightened despots. Who said everybody should have enlightened despots? Say it again. Bo yeah, Voltaire. Now, Rousseau was talking about the general will and the social contract. And I could see good and bad things about Rousseau because he's going to be used as justification for totalitarianism, but also for kind of classless democracy. So he's like all over the place. Of course, you can, probably, you can figure out which one I want more. So with that, enlightened deaths with that's Frederick the Great. So let's get to the first of the enlightened monarchs, considered Frederick the Great. So he's born in 1712. He would take over as a very young man, 27, when he took over as king of Prussia. And he succeeded his father. His father, Frederick William I, had built Prussia into a military power. Prussia was a small country. And so we finally have the map I could use for the right date. It's so wonderful. That's Prussia. It's here and here. Brandenburg, Prussia. It's relatively small and poor. But Frederick William built an army with what's conscription? What do we call conscription in the United States? The draft. He drafted young men into the army, trained, organized, professional soldiers using the new muskets and socket bayonets, double line of infantry, mobile artillery. So he built his son a great, a great army. And Frederick, uh, keep it in the tradition of all monarchs, Frederick William despised his son, and Frederick the Great, well, he wasn't the great dad, and Frederick his son despised him. In fact, Frederick was um, Frederick's best friend. Frederick was, uh, you know, this is something, it, they, they didn't talk about it, but it wouldn't be ostracized like it would be in the next century, but Frederick was almost certainly dead. And his, he was just always considered his best friend, but his, his lover was um, a young man. And Frederick William wanted his son to be a man. And so had his best friend executed in front of Frederick. And you can imagine, you know, that was his childhood, that his trauma of that. Also showed you what kind of person Frederick William was. There was, it wasn't, it, the, um, the persecution of, of, of gays would be really in the 19th century. Before it was just kind of, we didn't talk about it, whatever. It was, it was different. It, it, you know, that, it, those things kind of come off in that. But there is as a young man, I guess he was a fantastic musician, but turned out to be one of the greatest soldiers in history. And he, oh, we had the inscription, and here's another thing I almost forgot to say. Frederick William had passed on to his, his son, one thing you learn from Frederick William, you're not the king, so to speak, of the people and they're in total control. You are the first servant of the state. Your responsibility is to the state and the people of the state. Now, we can all argue what that means, what that encompasses. I agree all kinds of different points of view, but it's not like absolutism saying, I am the state. That's really different than Louis XIV, isn't it? I have a responsibility to the state. Now, that doesn't mean you'll make right decisions, because he'll make some really wrong decisions. 
But that's a big change. By the way, those eyes are scary. Looks like he just saw a UFO. Yeah, he saw something we don't want to see. So, this is his enlightened despotism. He did allow, which is pretty unusual, religious toleration for everybody, uh, at least for all Christians. No, not Jesus. And standardized legal codes. And it's one of those things, remember, if you have legal, co legal codes, it applies to everybody. That was a big element of, you think about almost every enlightened thinker. Rousseau, Voltaire, Montesquieu, Locke, standardized education available to more people than ever before. And they still, in, in Prussia, okay, if you go to Berlin, you know, it's, it's Prussia. And their education system still kind of follows the model in Prussia today. It's a little bit different if you go to, let's say, here. And I've read about that, but I know that now for a fact because my brother in law is a Berlin, so I heard about his school and a little bit of what they do. And he said, hey, so they do everything wrong in Cologne. I remember him telling me that. I'm like, well, first off, how would you know? <laughs> you went to school in West Berlin. All right. And then uh, trying to reduce the punishments. The whole idea of, let's say, you go, like if you're, you commit a crime and you go to jail for like five years or 10 years. I mean, who in here has done hard time? All right. A few of us, right? We've done hard time. That, that was unheard of. It'd just be judges would give sentences or kings would just give sentences. And the usual sentence was torture or the death penalty. They reduced <laughs> the torture. So it's only just a lot of torture instead of a whole lot of torture. So that's pretty good. So they got rid of some of the more barbaric tortures, like the branding or the splaying, uh, skinning, you have filet hunks of your back out, skinning you alive. They got rid of those. They just, they kept the wrap and everything like that. So it's more civilized torture. That's an interesting concept. Civilized torture. But the thing about it is, is of course it wasn't far enough. It's still, there's this idea that we've got to reduce this. And so it's gradual and far too slow a step. But the nobility in Prussia, that's what's the end. The, Unker, the Junkers, which is their nobility, the Junkers. I don't know if that's Junkers, but it's in the German. They, they remain in power, and they're going to be the officers. They're going to be the men in charge. If you ever see a German name and see a Vaughn, that's a Junker. Vaughn means a knight. Whenever they show any like generals, in fact, I'm just talking about in American history, Paul von Hindenburg. He'd be the German general and then the, the president, the last president of the Weimar Republic. He's the guy who would offer Hitler a chance to, to, uh, to form a government to keep the communists out. Serfdom remained, but it was reducing. So he's an example. Show we do Catherine. Here's another monarch, Catherine the Great. So Catherine the Great would reign in Russia. She be Tsarina, Catherine II or Catherine the Great. She was born in 1729, but take power in 1762. No, don't write her name down. She was a German princess. Remember, we did the maps of the Holy Roman Empire and all those little <coughs> principalities? Nobility had to marry other nobility. Where are there a lot of nobility? The Holy Roman Empire, because there's all these little tiny principalities. So you're going to have all these German princes and princesses marrying kings or nobility all around the world. So you're going to have, remember, the Hanoverians, George the First and Second, and George the Third of German, the German kings of Britain. That's why, because of all the nobility. So. The Romanov family, now we went to distant cousins, and those cousins were Germans. Well, she was going to marry the son of the Tsar, Rina. We'll get to her in just one second. She's German, but she was a Vic. She learned Russian. She learned Orthodox Church. She went through hell to learn it. And she, once she was a convert, I'm a Russian. Her husband, Peter, who would become Peter III. Peter III's mom, Elizabeth, 
overthrew her cousin, became Tsarina. She was a tough human. She took power, beat off opponents, and she was going to make sure that her son would succeed her and be successful. So she found a good German prince, so it wouldn't have any connection to the wars in Russia, Catherine. And so they got married at a very young age. That's Peter. And the marriage was, to say the least, um, a combination of horrifically awful and just weird. He, he also was one of those guys, he, he was like a little kid. When he became the czar, he was still known for playing with little toy soldiers. And like doing little battles and blowing things up, like playing with army men. And he would have these, um, they made the toys out of dough. They make dough and then heat up, they could paint it. So make little, and then he would like set them on fire and laugh and make big bonfires of soldiers. And then call his his young, you know, your beautiful wife in. It was like, this is not what I was told marriage would be like. Come play soldier with me. And he's the czar of Russia. And so that was what Catherine grew up in. And this picture, I mean, you kind of, yeah, I could see that. And so he actually, there was some religious reforms, if you think, while he was in charge. But Catherine's watching this, I mean, like, it's just absolutely mystifying. And some boyers are going to take power in there. Oh, I, I was just going to say, some boyers just basically overthrew Peter. And just said, we're going to arrest him. We don't want the guy gone. And they made Catherine Tsarina. And they thought Catherine could be controlled. She was, once she got over the initial shock, she was so much smarter and so much more ruthless than any of them. She became, she outfoxed the warriors. Anybody want to guess what happened to him? Yeah, they put him on. <laughs> it kind of looks like it's about ready to go, doesn't it? Looks like it's going. Yeah, it's like it's ready to go. He uh, was under. He, they went to a country estate in Russia called the Duma. Duma, I'm sorry. And while he was there, uh, there was a story that somebody was going to come and try to break him out. And so his guards, who were drunk at the time, panicked and tried to get him away so so he couldn't be uh, broken out of their little uh, house arrest. And in the process of getting him to a closet to hide him, they killed him. How do, you, it's, how do you kill a man when you try to hide him? Drunken guards. Wow. There you go. And so thus Catherine the Great. And let me do Catherine the Great real quick. <laughs> was she a reformer or a despot or both? Because that's the great thing about an enlightened despot. Aren't they already a despot? So was she a cruel dictator? And so, for example, one of her great moves, she was a brilliant person. In fact, she was so brilliant that the male boyers and future czars would, would, um, would make a law, they make laws if they want to, no more female czars, never again. So she summoned a legislative commission implying she's going to create a legislature and a laws and a constitution. She also had her people write down this hodgepodge of laws and tradition and also taking laws from, from Western Europe and going to codify the laws. And so this was seen as a great reform, reformation. Diderot, what did Diderot write? What did he make up? Going to codify all thought. He made up. Wasn't that like split with the uh, body? That's Montesquieu. I know we get. Uh, Encyclopedia. <coughs> Diderot like went to St. Petersburg and was going, like her advisor. And she did all this. But you notice I put down, eh, sort of. Did they codify laws? Sure. Did they apply to her? No. Did she make a did she actually make a legislature and a constitution? Right. No, they just kind of met and talked about it. They talked about what they completely yes. separate. They were planning to plan, but they didn't do it. Let me do one more thing about Catherine. So she would also fight two major wars with the Turk, the Ottoman Empire. They called it the Russo-Turkish War. The Russo-Turkish War. And there's going to be two, sometimes you call it the Turco-Russian War. Two really big, bitter wars. And here's the thing. She wanted 
Peter the Great got here. She wanted the Black Sea. That's what she wanted. And while they're going on, there's also going to be the never-ending fight with Sweden and also fight with Poland, Lithuania. So she's at war all the time. Two bloody wars. The first one was kind of a Russian victory. The second one, the Turks tried to take it back, and basically they ended up in a draw. We don't need to know the, the details of this war, but is this a reformer? Well, she would argue, yes, I'm spreading my reforms to the Crimea. So all these areas right here in yellow would be taken mostly under the reign of Catherine the Great. Gee, I wonder what country that is today. Let me ponder this for a second. Let me go through this. Yes, it's Wyoming. Yes, that's most of Ukraine. Now, one thing that's going to happen, there's going to be the Tartars, which are this um, kind of similar to the Cossacks who live here. They're going to get rid of them and settle Russians. There's going to have a big Russian population. There's also going to be a peasant rebellion. Cossacks are going to rebel under the leadership of a man by the name of Kujichev to get out of the, the czar, the emperor control. They talked about getting rid of serfdom, opening up land to the peasants. It was anti-czar. And what did Catherine do to this? I'll put it down. Put it down with great brutality and had him publicly executed. Also, we must get to the Potemkin villages. So, once you capture the Crimea and this area, they're Russifying it. So they're making it into these Russian villages and going to make it. And Alexander Potemkin was a person responsible for her, basically her chief minister. And Potemkin actually did a lot of great things, but Potemkin had a problem. They really didn't send that many Russians down here yet. And Catherine was going to take a great embassy down to Crimea and here to look at her new empire, all the Russians who went there. And Potemkin is like, ah, there's, there's no one there. What do you do? Well, they knew Catherine was going to stay in this basically house on a sled. It was, I guess, just luxurious. I just think it would be funny if, like, the thief tried to steal the house, but take the horse. She still likes the horse side of it. They'd have to be pretty tough thieves to get past the guards. But yeah, and so what did they do? It came out that Potemkin was going to make fake towns, just basically false fronts and have all kinds of Russian peasants, you know, like peasants here. And then she go see the town. And then as soon as she leaves, they go to the next town and make a new town. And so that became the infamous Potemkin villages. Now, that's kind of a myth. Catherine found out and went to him and said, is this what you're going to do? And they're like, no, not a chance. So they forced at bayonet point thousands of Russians to very quickly move and build kind of cities. So they actually kind of did build them. But whenever you hear Potemkin Village, that means it looks grand, but it's fake underneath. So here's a picture of a, um, trying to disguise you. Here's the great Russian village. And they got some of the peasants. They put them with nice new clothes. As Catherine went by, as those without clothes hid behind me. And whenever she wanted to see more, they put on a big firework show, which just kind of makes me laugh. But that's Catherine the Great. And we'll stop right there. We'll get to Poland, and then we'll do, we got one more king, then we got a big war, and then we're done. Uh, which war is that? The, well, actually, we got two wars. We've got the War of the Austrian Secession and the Seven Years' War. Yes, just like the War of the Spanish Secession, we have another one. So that gives us a Spanish Secession, Austrian Secession. So Prince William, who is um, the second into the line of the throne for, for Britain, yeah, Prince Charles and his son William, he was talking about Ukraine and he said, you know, this is so unusual. There's, there's fights like this. You expect wars like this in Africa and Asia, but Europeans would never fight like this. So first off, that is intensely prejudiced and bigoted. And secondly, are you really that dumb? What did we talk about the entire time in this class, it seems like? Peace. You think the king of England is that dumb? Yeah. Or the, the prince, I'm sorry? Yes. Uh, yeah, yes. probably. Yeah, they're all in there. He was a soldier. 
Y'all have to be. He fought in Afghanistan. He demanded. And so did his brother. They demanded to get into combat with little you know, a little bit. But then they realized it would look really bad if the prince was out. What do we have next? Oh, let me show you something real quick. We've seen that picture before. It's right by my door. So what does that mean? Save gas. So they call them car sharing clubs, but it's carpooling, what we would say today. The whole thing was, it wasn't to save gas, it was to save rubber. So they ration gas to save rubber. And I just thought this was amusing, since we're talking about Russia, if someone had this. I thought that was kind of clever, so I thought I'd show it to you guys. This whole picture is starting to curl up. I can't tack it in because I'm metal out there. It's really strong your tacks to go right through it. Maybe a... Use a blowtorch. You have the end of the tack and just mount into a wall. There I use a cement nail to go through there. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> no, that one, it's just a, since it's a wood, the little hooks will stick. But they, they don't stick as well on the same form. I better show this to class next period too. Did I get a talk about the vigilante parade? 